Hi, my name is Tammy Medlin and I'm the local history genealogy librarian at the Wilson County Library and today we're doing a tour of Maplewood Cemetery here in Wilson. Now this is the Woodard family monument and actually this is the family they bought Maplewood from. Um, in 1876 the town of Wilson bought 14 acres from Warren and Jerusa Woodard and then a about 1887, they bought 14 more acres. But this is the Woodard Family Monument. It's based on an Egyptian obelisk. And actually, it is the tallest monument here in the cemetery. Now, what you may not know is there was, a former, there was another cemetery that was on Goldsboro Street. Wilson County came in 1855, and by the 1870s, that cemetery was filling up. So what they did is they said if you had a plot in the old cemetery, you could have a plot in the new cemetery. So they actually went in and moved all the bodies. Now another thing that's interesting about the Woodard Cemetery is you can see we have the obelisk and if you look around here behind me we have a lot of smaller stones facing the obelisk. We have a set of about five stones right over here and then we have a set, let's see, 1861, 1864, 1873. So these are all from the 1800s. And then we have three graves over here that are all for children. The three little crosses with the statue of Jesus with the children at the back. But this is all the Woodard family. Okay, well this is the gra another 19th century grave, and this is the grave of Arena Acock. Now you're thinking Acock, you're thinking Acock birthplace in Fremont. Um, governor Charles B. Acock was governor from 1901 to 1905 and this is actually the grave of his first wife, Verena. And she died in 1889 and after she died, Acock later married her sister. But at the time, he was a lawyer. So that's, she is buried here in Wilson and he is buried at Oakwood Cemetery in uh, Raleigh. Now we just found one. I did not know about. This is their son, Charles B. Acock, and he was their son. He outlived his mother, but he died when he was um, 18 years old. But the, and I had, I was, I worked at Acock Birthplace, and I had heard about Charles B. Acock II, and I had heard about Verena, but I just found one I didn't know about. This is Ernest W. Acock, and I'm going to assume Ernest is D Woodard, but it says first child of C.B and V.W. Verena Acock, and he died when he was two months old. So apparently they had another child named Ernest, and then they had Charles, and then I think they had a daughter. But later, Charles had a lot of children with her sister, but as I said, they are buried in Raleigh. If you want to learn more about Charles B. Acock and Verena, take a trip down to Fremont to the Charles B. Acock birthplace. Okay, this is the grave of Mary Cleves, Seabrook and she actually became Mary Cleves Daniels and she was the first female postmistress of Wilson and one of the first female postmistresses in the state of North Carolina. Okay this is what's called the mound and it is full of unknown soldiers who died in the Civil War Hospital here in Wilson and the reason I'm pointing this out is they were actually buried in the Old Town Cemetery because the Civil War ended in 1865 this one was bought in 1876, so these would have been some of the graves that were bodies that were actually dug up and moved and reinterred here in Maplewood. This is one of the more interesting tombstones in the cemetery to me. This says Professor A. Danton, intrepid high diver, leapt from life into eternity at Goldsboro, North Carolina, the night of May 13, 1904. And you can see there is some two hands clasp up here for like friendship or reunion in eternity. And it was erected by J.J. Jones of the Carnival Company. And what happened is the Carnival stopped here in Wilson in 1904. Well, the next stop was Goldsboro. And Professor Danton was a high diver. He was from Hungary. And what you, he dived at night. I could not find an article in the paper here in Wilson because the paper from 1904 did not survive. So I went and looked at the Goldsboro paper. And what happened is he raised the height of his tower where he was dying, di diving from by about 10 feet. And 
it, he would come out close to midnight. They would have torches set all around the tank of water. And they actually would even set the water on fire. There was gasoline. And he would come out. And when I read the article in the Goldsboro Argus, it said he set himself on fire and then dived down. And I had to go back and reread that. I'm like, I read that wrong. There's no way he set himself on fire. I didn't know they had fire retardant suits in 1904, but apparently he did. Um, and he would dive down and the water would put the fire out. Well, apparently this time he missed or miscalculated and he hit his head or his neck on the side of the tank. Um, they took him to a house or a hotel nearby and he passed away the next day. Now, apparently he had had a friendship, struck up a romance with a young lady here in Wilson. And he said if he died, he wanted to be brought back to Wilson. So that is what he did. The carnival paid for the marker, and according to local stories, every time the carnival would come to down, come to town hereafter, they would stop and play music, come to the grave, and just remember their, their friends who had fallen here, but leapt into eternity, and that is exactly what he did. So when you visit a cemetery, one thing you should keep an eye out for is the funerary art. Uh, funerary art was a big thing, especially in the latter half of the 19th century. Around the mid part of the 19th century, uh, there was a push towards large communal graveyards, which replaced the traditional burying places of the churchyard cemetery or the family plot on your farmstead. Uh, this was a thing that came with the growing of cities. You would buy a family plot in the graveyard and it almost as well as being a place to bury your dead, it was a place to visit the dead. You would get together with your family and go out and sit on your family plot with this picnic on Sunday afternoon. And you'd sit there with your mother and your father and just enjoy the scenery and the beauty of the cemetery. Because that beauty was so important in the 19th century, many of the tombstones are very, they're works of art, they're sculptures, not just burial markers and some interesting symbolism in the tombstones and just some beautiful examples. Uh, here we have little Mary. She has a lovely lozenge shaped tombstone. So here we have a very fine example of uh, traditional Victorian funerary sculpture. Uh, this one is for a little child sent grave. This is little Virginia Barnes who died in 1893, age two. And you'll see a lot of stones like that in these cemeteries. Uh, infant mortality rate before the advent of vaccinations was terrible. And you see so many beautiful little graves. Uh, but this one is a very fine example of a particular type of sculpture called a rockery. These were big in the late Victorian period. And you see some very nice symbolism here. You've got the scroll and you've got the lamb. Lambs are almost always a symbol of a child's grave. Occasionally you'll see them on an older child, but most of the time it usually indicates a child who is very young. And it says on the bottom, Christ carries our lamb in his bosom. Speaking of infant mortality, here was a, one little tombstone that just really touched my heart. This is Frank and Fred Gardner. Uh, you can see that they both died before they were even a year old. And it says, our little twins, sons of John W. and Callie Gardner so sweet and so sad. So the family plot was almost like an extension of your own yard and one of the ways that that came that you could see that was in the demarcations at the edges of your family plot. Here we have a fantastic example of a grave railing. Um, you don't see as many of these. A lot of them were scrapped during the wars for the metal content but sometimes you can still find grave railings and you'll see how they used it to mark the edge of the family plot. This is the Heinz family plot. And um, you'll see that the Heinz tombstones, which were originally standing up, have been laid down due to wear and tear. But yes, this is just a very interesting example of a fine cast iron grave railing. Popular monument shapes. The obelisk was very popular. You'll see a lot of those in Victorian era cemeteries. This is a very nice example. And then right next to it, pillars and an urn. Urns, again, were a very popular symbol. And then here we have a beautiful Celtic cross. You see crosses fairly often in cemeteries, but Celtic crosses are pretty rare over here. They're a lot more popular in Great Britain. 
So there are several interesting things going on with this tombstone. This is a fine example of a pulpit style stone, which if you look, you can see it's shaped like a pulpit. Hence the name. These were very popular around the turn of the century in the early 1900s. So this is interesting from that aspect. And it's also interesting. It's got a fine example of an open Bible carved on the top. And the symbol carved on the front is the heavenly gates ajar. There was a woman who lost her brother. She wrote a very popular novel about his spirit talking to her through the gates ajar. And it was a knockout sensation in the Victorian period. And heavenly gates ajar appeared on all kinds of merchandise. You could get gates ajar stationery. You could get gates ajar decorative pins to wear. And of course, you could get a heavenly gates ajar tombstone. So all of those are interesting facets about this tombstone. But what I think is the most interesting thing about it is where they got it. Because this tombstone was bought through the Sears Roebuck catalog. Sears Roebuck, up through about 1950, sold tombstones in their catalogs. You could purchase it and it would be shipped by rail freight to your location. They advertised them as being great values. And you will find these scattered throughout cemeteries throughout all across America. So here we have an interesting example of something else that happened with the Sears Roebuck tombstones. You'll see that these are very similar to the one I just took a picture of, but there's some, some little differences. These are a very fine example of a knockoff. People would take the Sears Roebuck catalog to their local gravestone carver and say, I'd like one that looks like that, and he would oblige. You find the genuine Sears Roebuck tombstones throughout these cemeteries, and you also find ones that someone local just did in imitation. Another type of funerary art that was popular in the Victorian period, uh, tree trunks were a popular symbol. Uh, you'll see them sometimes in the form of Woodsmen of the World, which was a fraternal organization of the period, but you'll often just see them even without that connotation. They were a symbol of growth and a symbol of being cut off. Um, this one is one of the most beautiful tree trunk examples I have ever seen. It's oh, an entire family is on this trunk. You've got Stevenses and Hackneys and Coopers. And as you walk around it, you'll see more and more of the family carved on the trunk. It's very rare to see one that is this elaborate and detailed. And we're very lucky to have such a beautiful example right here in Maplewood Cemetery. And here we have an interesting corner of the cemetery. This is the Bethel Congregation, which is to say the Jewish section of the cemetery. A lot of times you will find that the Jewish cemeteries are separate, but in Wilson, it was right in the same area as the Christian burials. A notable person who is buried here is Leon Leder, who ran a very successful department store in Wilson for a time. So we started this tour with some of, with the largest tombstone in the cemetery, and now we're going to end with the smallest. You see rows on rows here of small monuments, each one marked with a number. This is the Potter's Field. That's a term for a cemetery section that is for the pauper's graves. These are people who could not afford to bury themselves, who could not afford a fancy monument, and were buried um, at the public cost. And each person has been marked with just a simple monument with a number so that the tomb can be identified. But it's such a modest little marker for the end of a life. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this tour of the historic cemetery. And um, I'm Genevieve Bailey, signing out for the Wilson County Public Library. Thank you.